Hello and welcome to Global News Today, bringing you exclusive insights and fresh perspectives from leading experts and influential decision makers every weekday right here on Al Arabiya News. I'm Tom Burgess Watson coming up on today's programme. With just eight days until the US election, Donald Trump travels to the swing state of Georgia after rallying at a packed out Madison Square Garden. Kamala Harris takes her campaign to Michigan, a state with a significant Arab American and Muslim population. Tehran vows to use all available tools to respond to Israel's attack on military targets in Iran during the course of the weekend. And ceasefire negotiations resume in Doha, with diplomats actively seeking to de-escalate tensions and address urgent humanitarian needs in Gaza. Hello and welcome. With just eight days remaining now before the U.S. election, former President Donald Trump is going to travel to Georgia today, whilst Vice President Kamala Harris is going to focus her efforts on energizing the electorate in Michigan. That's a state with a significant Arab American and Muslim population. Well, last night, Trump held a high-profile rally at Madison Square Garden in his hometown of New York City, where he repeatedly underscored his commitment to tightening immigration, emphasizing plans to halt undocumented entry and deport what he described as vicious and bloodthirsty criminals. The United States is now an occupied country, but it will soon be an occupied country no longer. Not going to be happening. Not going to be happening. November 5th, 2024, nine days from now, will be Liberation Day in America. It's going to be Liberation Day. On day one, I will launch the largest deportation program in American history to get the criminals out. I will rescue every city and town that has been invaded and conquered. And we will put these vicious and bloodthirsty criminals in jail. We're going to kick them the hell out of our country as fast as possible. Donald Trump speaking there. Well, Vice President Kamala Harris campaigned in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. That's a critical swing state where she urged voters to take an active role in the election. Philly, we have nine days, nine days to get this done. And for the next nine days, no one can sit on the sidelines. There is too much on the line, and we must not wake up the day after the election and have any regrets about what we could have done in these next nine days. So let's spend these next nine days knowing we did everything we could. Kamala Harris speaking there. Well, voter turnout has already reached notable levels. More than 41 million Americans have cast their ballots early. That's according to data compiled by the University of Florida's Election Lab. Meanwhile, recent polling data suggests a tight race at the national level. A new CBS News YouGov poll released on Sunday shows that Vice President Harris currently holds a slim lead over Trump, with 50% of likely voters supporting her, uh, compared to 49% for Donald Trump. Well, although Harris has a slight edge, the poll's results fall well within the margin of error, indicating a highly competitive contest. Well, in the battleground states, the same poll shows a straight 50-50 split between the two candidates. An additional anal analysis uh, from 538's daily election poll tracker reflects similar trends, with Harris maintaining a slight national lead over Trump as of Sunday, holding a 1.4 percentage point advantage. However, the long-term polling trends suggest that the race is continuing to tighten, with the gap narrowing uh, from a 1.7 point lead uh, just one week prior. Well, for more analysis of the U.S. election, I'm joined by the former member of Donald Trump's White House transition team, Jan Halper Hayes, and a former member of uh, and a former senior advisor to Joe Biden and former director of communications for Biden while he was vice president. Mo Vella. Mo, thank you for joining us once again here. Let me start with you, because uh, we spoke uh, back in July and you told me you thought Kamala Harris was definitely going to beat Donald Trump. Uh, do you still think that? I do, actually. I think, actually, I, I believe that more now than I did in July. Um, 
the momentum is on her side. Um, I think what we saw yesterday at Madison Square Garden, uh, being a Hispanic myself, uh, what I heard from Mr. Trump and his allies and his speakers at his rally, um, I, I honestly, I almost threw up uh, because it was so disgusting and despicable, discriminatory, um, divisive. Um, and I just think our, our, my fellow Americans, we're sick and tired of it. Um, that's not who we are. Those aren't American values. So I do. I think she's going to win. Jan, we're looking at uh, the tightest election in, in modern times possibly here. That's if the polls are to be believed. Uh, what are your thoughts and um, what do you have to say to what Mo just uh, stated there? Well, I'm glad you mentioned the polls because 2016, everyone thought Hillary was going to get it. Um, and I, I don't have much trust in the pollsters. What I've really been looking at is the momentum of early voting. Usually the Democrats have us beat. And this election season, the percentage of turnout, especially in all seven swing states, has been enormously high. Um, the percentages are greater than the Democrats that have shown. And the momentum, you, you really have to look at about two weeks out. So now what are we, nine days out? The momentum just keeps on increasing. And, um, you know, there's like Chicken Little and the sky is falling. You can only call him a fascist so much. You can only you know, make those negative comments. It's been going on for nine years. People no longer pay attention to that. But it's an exciting momentum. And the fact that several Democrats are part of his transition team and will be part of his new administration really is bringing home that we are the big tent party. OK, Mo, 40 million people have cast their ballots early. Um, just picking up on what Jan was saying there, who's, to whose advantage does that play, do you think? Well, you know, I, uh, believe it or not, I don't disagree on one point, which is uh, that early voting has been a stronghold for the Democratic Party. Um, I'm not concerned about uh, whether it's, it's going to break that way this time or not, to be honest with you. Um, I think we are seeing historic early voting numbers. I will point out very quickly that that is the early voting that Mr. Trump and um, and all of his little minions and cult followers have been telling people was horrible and you shouldn't engage in. And all of a sudden they're bragging about it. It's the hypocrisy of, of Mr. Trump and his followers is just amazing. I'm smiling because I noticed she did not address what I just said. And ma'am, with all due respect, when the former chief of staff to the president of the United States calls his former boss a fascist, and he's a four-star general, four-star general who served our nation with incredible honor, and you just called him a liar? Come on. I didn't call him a liar. Nine years, you can but call him a, a fascist is, is a fascist is a fascist. The argument is between, <laughs> the arguments between the globalists and the nationalists. And don't any change the subject. One. Address address what I just brought up, ma'am. Don't deflect and change the subject. That's all you guys can do because you can't me. seem to answer with the excuse truth. Excuse me. Excuse me. I would not excuse be you? Okay. attacking Go ahead, John. you. I would not be attacking you, so I would appreciate not being attacked. The fact uh, ma'am, I just ask you to that, answer the question. That's all. If that's attacking you, you just know, tell we're not, the truth. I, I, we're not going to proceed in this if you want to keep interrupting and you want to take control of this interview. So I would like just to finish. answer the question. I would like you to be quiet. And okay, I am going please to let Jan speak. Mo, let's, let's listen to what Jan has to say. Go ahead. The fact is that whether it's Mark Milley or it's John Kelly, or it's McManus. The fact is that they wanted us in wars. They did not like the fact that for the first time in 82 years, we had a president that did not take us to war. And he can call him names. And if you guys want to use name calling and that's his opinion, he also got fired. 
So let's just understand why he got fired. You know, you can launch on to any of the criticism, but at the General same Milley time, how come you're not focusing on the General positives? General Milley got fired? Let's not lie on television, ma'am. General Milley got fired? Is that what you just said? No, Kelly. Kelly got fired. And But you're calling him a liar. Is that correct? Because that's what you're calling him. No. Let's be clear. Um. Uh, excuse me, Mo. Who's doing this interview, ma'am? I'm just we're de- ma'am, but we're supposed to be having a, a debate. I'm asking you: Are you calling General Kelly a liar? Yes or no? It sure sounds like you are. I'm not calling him a liar. I don't agree with him. Okay, let's find something you both might agree on, because we've been talking, uh, you know, here, we've already started talking about something I wanted to ask you about anyway, which is the kind of heated rhetoric of this campaign. I mean, quite extreme. Um, Donald Trump's childhood friend at the weekend, uh, his name is David Rem, called Harris the Antichrist and the Devil. Um, Then a businessman called Grant Cardone uh, called Harris, said Harris... Uh, and her pimp handlers will destroy our countries, uh, our country. And then we've heard the Democrats using this language like Nazis and fascists. I mean, this is pretty unprecedented language on both sides, isn't it, Mo? Um, to be honest with you, um, I don't know that we've ever had a more joyful candidate than Kamala Harris. Um, here's the sad part. When Mr. Trump, every word that comes out of the man's mouth, from the time he came down that escalator the first time, has been hateful and negative and divisive and racist and transphobic and homophobic and misogynistic all nine years, all nine years. So you can either expect, do you really think we're going to sit back and go, oh yeah, just keep saying that she's stupid, which he does every day, that she has a low IQ. And then with all due respect, this this, uh, lady you have on here, is now saying, don't call me names, when her candidate, who she's sitting here advocating for, is a convicted felon who has done nothing but hate. Okay, Jan, you respond. You can't have it both ways. Let's let Jan respond. You can't have it both ways. Well, it's inaccurate to call him a convicted felon because he hasn't been sentenced yet. But the thing ma'am, is I'm an attorney. That- ma'am. No, I'm not going to let Would you, you do this. Would you please be quiet and not Are interrupt you an attorney? Me. Are you an attorney? Um, I wish that you would cut his mic when I'm speaking because I can't. This is typical of the bullying that the liberals oh my do God. and oh won't my God. even hear what I have to say. Seizes on a moment. Ma'am, you and cannot lie on television. The let's, let, let's let Jan finish her point, and then you can pick up on any of the things you disagree with afterwards. Mm-hmm. Jan, go ahead. Sure, whatever. But lying right. is not allowed. <laughs> um, the fact is that this is probably one of the worst uh times that the language has been going back and forth. I have always disagreed with negative advertising, but the consultants feel that that works. And when you don't stop something, it keeps growing and it gets worse. And that is exactly what's going on. It's unbecoming to both sides. It is not something that if I were advising that I would recommend, but it's reality. Mo, I'd like to ask uh, about something that was said at the weekend. Uh, The comedian Tony Hinchcliffe, uh, who said the U.S. territory of Puerto Rico is literally a floating island of garbage. I'm wondering how you think that went down, because you have have, have, have obviously you come from a Latino uh, community yourself. And I just want to know whether you think as well this might have actually backfired on Donald Trump, because how's that going to go down with uh, people of Latino origin who might otherwise have, have wanted to support him? There are somewhere close to a half a million Puerto Ricans in Pennsylvania, the swing state of all swing states, right? And I am going to tell you, as a fourth generation American of Latino heritage myself, um, it's not only despicable, it's personal to all of us 
it's personal and it was offensive and it was nauseating. And, and this is why I'm frustrated because when anybody can get on a TV show like my colleague here and, and defend and try to rationalize and make sense of that kind of hatred when we should just be saying, you know what, if you vote for Donald Trump, you're okay with that. That's what's happening here. And that's my whole point is you can't have it both ways. This is vile, vile what that guy did. But he was invited by Mr. Trump. Mr. Trump did his podcast. Mr. Trump loves him. He loves Mr. Trump. The crowd went crazy and cheering when he said that horrible, despicable stuff. Jan, do, do you agree with uh, what, what that gentleman said uh, with regards to Puerto Rico? Or do you think, in fact, he's done the Republicans a, a, a major disservice? No, I think the problem is that Democrats don't have a sense of humor. And they oh. launch or pick things. And then what happens is that all they do is focus on that. They don't f focus on Vivek Ramaswamy, who was talking about how anyone can get ahead. They didn't focus on Robert F. Kennedy Jr. and what he had to say about making our country healthy. They didn't focus on Tulsi Gabbard and um, her talking about liberty and happiness and that. So they ignore that. They hear one thing wrong and they focus on it. And then every diatribe, negative diatribe, just goes for that. Wow. And as on a result, of, on behalf they of Hispanic don't Americans, understand Americans, why. Mo, we'll give you a chance to speak in a moment. Mo, Mo, we'll come to you in just a moment. Go ahead, Jen. Yeah, but come on. You know what? I can't even listen to this garbage. Seriously. We'll, we'll come this to you. This is so we'll come offensive. Here. This is so offensive, lady. I just told okay. you on behalf of Hispanic Americans, and you are now deflecting again? You're actually saying um, we don't have a sense of humor? I want to thank you. What is Mo, wrong I with you? I want to thank you for what showing exactly how you? liberals are a bully. I, I want to thank with you for you, your behavior because it is, is so is disrespectful. Ma'am, what is wrong is with you? What is wrong you with what? you? How do you live with yourself? That's horrible. Horrible. Okay, let's You're let's let's us? let's keep this let's keep this civil. Let's um let's I want to ask an, another another point that was raised during the rally at the weekend. We heard Trump's uh, former advisor Stephen Miller saying that America is for Americans only. Um Jan, what did you make of what does he mean? Well, I think what he means is that anyone who comes here legally is welcomed. But we have had an influx of illegals that has increased the crime rate and has turned almost every town into a border town. And it is unfair if you talk to anyone who went through our legal process to get here and to become citizens or to get a green card, they're not happy with it either. Mo, go ahead. You wanted to jump in. I feel so sorry for this, this uh, particular colleague. Um, Ma'am, I grew up on a border town. You have no idea what you're talking about, number one. Number two, my family came here legally and migrated to this company, con country in 1852, okay? So do not lecture me or anybody else on border towns and what it's like to be an immigrant and immigrant families. You have no idea what you're talking about. Let's talk the truth. Crime is down in the United States. Inflation is down in the United States, okay? For anybody who commits a crime, whether they're here legally or illegally, they should be punished. No one disagrees with that but to demonize other people. And then I can just wait five more minutes and you're gonna claim you're a born again Christian or an evangelical because that's what you all do. And then five seconds later, you're demonizing humanity. 
and you're okay with Tony Hinchcliffe calling my fellow Hispanics garbage. So you know what? I can't tolerate your hypocrisy. You have no idea what you're talking about with all due respect. You know, I don't, have you even been to the border? Yes, I have. Where, ma'am, um, what city I, did you I go to? I find your need to go after me um, <laughs> reprehensible. Because ma'am, you're lying to the audience, professional. Okay, let's let's no, keep it let's keep it civil and no no personal no, attacks from either side. No I'm personal out. attacks. No. Uh, I, what's, not, what's unprofessional? You know what? Let's be clear. Let's be clear. What's um, unprofessional? I am not going is, to keep on listening to you. So stop lecturing me. Stop interrupting let's me. Let's keep this. And let's keep this informative. Being an ass. Let's keep this informative for um, for our viewers. Informative means truth. Informative means facts. Okay. okay, let me raise if another wanna, point. If you want to be informative, you cannot you allow what? people Cut to get on mic, and lie. Or I'm just getting okay. off of this because let's, let's... I did not sign up. Okay, to let's be uh, then goodbye, ma'am. No, no, let's way. let's keep this let's keep this civil. Let's not let's not uh, no no but personal I, attacks. Listen, I am not going to participate in anybody allowing any enabling somebody to lie to an audience. I don't tolerate you're it. You're not enabling if, if me. You're allowed to. You're allowed to I pull each other my out. I have opinion, and if see, if, if, this is, if you're this going to have, if you're going do. to defend the kind of hatred and vile things that were said, which is what you've done in this interview, you literally which you blamed, have demonstrated your own behavior you, of you violence. You literally have. All right, can I? Can I? Can I? Can we? Can we do a? Can we do a gear problem. change here at this point? I just want to. I want to. I want to. There's some other topics we can talk about, and, and I'd really like to get your opinion on another element of the program uh, when we've been talking about the situation in the Middle East. I'd like to ask you both, having uh, you know, during this segment, we'll be talking about the situation in the Middle East and what impact it's had on uh, the U U.S. election. Um, what impact do you think it has had? Do you think it has cost Kamala Harris, as some of our guests on this channel have told us, uh, being supportive of, of Israel and, and the Biden administration being supportive of Israel? Do you think that is something that has cost uh, Kamala Harris on this, uh, in, in, in terms of her chances in the election, Mo? I think that it has uh, rightfully caused some tremendous concern by some of my brothers and sisters that are Muslim Americans. Um, what we're seeing in Gaza is also disgraceful and heartbreaking. Too many innocent, in particular children, are dying. Um, this is a very conflicting situation for, I hope I speak on behalf of all of my fellow Americans. We want to support Israel as we always have and we always will and support their right to defend themselves. But at the same time, I, I am actually uh, of the opinion that we need to be supporting Israel at some point with some conditions, which mean no uh, inhumane warfare um, and much more strategic and targeted attacks on, uh, on others so that these innocent victims are not uh, you know, falling prey to this. So look, I don't think it's damaged Ms. Harris. I don't think it's helped Mr. Trump. I think it is a very sad and heartbreaking situation uh, right now in the Middle East, period. Jan, can I ask you, what do you think a, a second Trump administration would bring to the table as far as the situation in the Middle East is concerned? I think that his goal would to be to bring peace. You can go back to the Abraham Accords. It was uh, trending to go in that direction. I think he'd also focus on solving the issues between Russia and Ukraine. Okay, and he he says he's the the candidate of peace. Uh, he's a, he's a deal breaker. Are you are you confident that he could uh, somehow broker a deal and and put a stop to the fighting as he has promised to do in both uh, Ukraine and in in Gaza? I definitely have that great belief in him that he can do that. Mo, what are your thoughts? What do you think a, a Trump administration would bring to the table in this regard? Uh, we we know what it is, Tom. We know what it is. He literally loves Vladimir Putin, sent him a COVID test while our fellow Americans were dying. Literally. That's a fact. 
And so we know what he's going to do to, quote unquote, solve the Ukraine-Russia thing. He's going to side with Russia, the most evil empire probably in modern times. That's how he, quote unquote, would create peace. And What's anybody your... who is voting for him knows that. They know that. This is a man who has praised dictators over and over. He's clearly told us he wants to be a dictator in the United States. Maya Angelou was a beautiful, amazing American poet and writer and author. And she once taught us in one of her writings, believe them when they tell you who they are the first time. I believed him when he told me who he was nine years ago. And I think enough Americans believed him and are going to cast their ballots accordingly for Kamala Harris. And I think we will not have to deal with all of this vile, hateful, negative, divisive, horrible rhetoric that we keep hearing over and over for nine years. We're sick of it. Let's move on. Okay. Let's Jen, could I ask... Could, could ask for your reaction to, to what Mose just said there? In particular, the well, claims about Vladimir I, I, Putin. Uh, it depends, uh, once again, on um, what your policies are and what your positions are. And the fact is that if you listen to some foreign policy experts, they think making Putin the bad guy and every uh, making them an enemy is the worst thing. I mean, we want peace. The American public wants peace across the world. We don't need to have these wars. And we want Vladimir democracies Putin, to thrive. We want democracies to thrive and survive, ma'am. That means you don't coddle dictators. Okay, how do you respond you know, to the... Tom, I wish you hadn't said we could interrupt one another because he's taken great advantage of that. But Ma'am, because uh, you're, you're literally coddling a dictator. He has. Well, it, it, coddling, it, you just literally advocated for coddling and being kind to a dictator. That's what you just did. Think about what you just said. analysis you want want to make okay, Tom I actually have to right. go unfortunately but thank you for having me oh thank okay. god all right well we're gonna have to leave it there really appreciate you both uh, taking the time to speak to us I'm sorry the connection didn't make for uh, uh, an ideal uh, debating set of circumstances but thank you uh, Mo Vella and thank you as well to Jan Halper Hayes thank you very much indeed to you both you're welcome To the situation in the Middle East now, and uh, an Iranian foreign ministry spokesperson says that Tehran has, is vowing to use all available tools to respond to Israel's attack on military targets in Iran during the weekend. Iran says that Saturday's strikes against military sites in killed four soldiers, but the attacks were more limited than had been expected. Well, earlier today, Iranian media reported that a civilian was also killed. Well, Israeli officials say the airstrikes were carried out as a direct response to an Iranian missile barrage launched on the 1st of October, which Iran says was in response to the assassination of the Hezbollah leader, Hassan Nasrallah, earlier on this month. Meanwhile, negotiations aimed at resolving the year-long conflict between Israel and Hamas have resumed in Doha, where diplomats are working to find ways to de-escalate tensions and address humanitarian needs. Well, Egypt has proposed a temporary two-day truce in Gaza to facilitate the exchange of Israeli citizens for Palestinian prisoners. Well, let's cross now to Michigan, and we can speak to Abed Hamoud, who is a lawyer of Lebanese origin and a former federal prosecutor, who's also the founder of the Arab American Political Action Committee. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us. Um, there's an article that appeared this summer in which you were quoted, and it had the headline caption, Courting the Muslim American vote, alienated by Republicans, taken for granted by Democrats. Does that sort of roughly sum up the situation in your opinion? Uh, that's correct. It was alienated by the Republicans. But recently, with the events in the Middle East, I think is also alienated by the Democrats, taken for granted and alienated by Democrats. Why do you say taken for, taken for granted? Because traditionally, we've always voted Democrat, mostly, not traditionally, uh, what I mean mostly Democratic, but 
I believe, taken for granted because the Democratic Party, they know they need our votes and they are in power and they can impact and they can stop the war in the Middle East, especially in Gaza and Lebanon. And they did nothing about that. In fact, if anything, I genuinely believe the Biden administration encouraged Netanyahu to continue and enlarge his wars by providing weapons and support, political and financial. So to me, if they really wanted our vote, they would not go this route. In fact, they're literally telling us, we're probably going to get your vote regardless. It doesn't matter. And I see that the Republicans are trying harder to get our vote. And from talking to people in your in, in your entourage, your friends, your colleagues, people who are also uh, Arab Americans, are they telling you, are you getting a lot of evidence that people are indeed not going to vote for the Democrats based on uh, foreign policy issues? Absolutely. In fact, until a few days ago, no one would actually loudly say that they are going to vote Democratic. Uh, like I said, it's, uh, the, the important part of what you said is the base on foreign policy. We traditionally, including myself, who I'm a long life Democrat. I mean, I'm long, I've always been a Democrat, a lifelong Democrat, and I've always voted Democratic, and I was involved in the Democratic Party. And we've always made these choices based on mostly domestic issues, as both parties were similar when it came to Israel and foreign policy, but they were kind of moderate to a certain extent. The position the Democrats took this time in the Biden administration, which includes uh, Vice President Harris, the position they took towards the uh, war in the Middle East right now, uh, put us all to be one item, one issue voters, which is the Middle East and the war right now. So we all forget of all the domestic agendas. So everybody will tell you, no way, there is no way they'll get my vote. Only in a few last few days, with a lot of uh, pressure from the Harris campaign, a few Arab American Democrats, people either in office or aspiring to be in office, I'm saying few, literally, there may be 10 people met in a room or something like that. And they said, we're supporting you know, Vice President Harris. But I can tell you, um, I don't have a statistic that's scientific, but the overwhelming majority of our community would either vote third party, nobody, or for Donald Trump. Donald Trump is gaining grounds a lot in this community the last few days. He's been around here a lot, too. Yeah, I was going to ask what voter intentions were therefore going to be, and, and you've answered my question, either Trump or a third party. Um, the word betrayal. But some will not participate. Some will not vote. Our PAC okay. actually recommended to skip the presidential race. OK, so non-participation uh, entirely. And Non-participation, but we strongly urge not to vote for Harris or Trump. OK. I've, I heard the word betrayal being used to describe how a lot of Arab and Muslim Americans feel about President Biden and, by extension, uh, Kamala Harris. Do you think the word betrayal is the right I word? Absolutely. Betrayal for more than one thing. Betrayal, first of all, in 2016, Donald Trump won Michigan by 10,000 votes. Our community was not too enthusiastic about Hillary Clinton. In 2020, we came out in numbers. We campaigned hard, including myself on the PAC I founded. We campaigned hard for Joe Biden, who won the presidency not by a long distance, probably, I think, 150,000 votes, which is still small in a state like Michigan. So we worked hard for them. But it's not just a betrayal for the Arab American or Muslim community. It's a betrayal for the American values and the democratic values, the Democratic Party values that I grew up to believe in and that I worked in a party based on the human values, human rights values. They're seeing the killing. They're seeing the genocide. They are seeing a person who is out of control, who's happened to be the extreme right in Israel running the place. I don't understand as a Democrat how can a democratic government in the United States side so strongly and encourage an extreme right government in Israel? I'm not getting it. So betrayal for the values they should be believing in, not just betrayal for our vote. Yeah, during the uh, weekend, we saw uh, Donald Trump campaigning in Michigan. Um, he invited some Muslim leaders onto the stage with him as well. And um, what sort of an impact do you think that had? It's, it's a strong, it's going to have a strong impact. I mean, Donald Trump, I can tell you, and I'm no fan of Donald Trump, and I have a lot of reservations. As you said, my background is in prosecution, and I have my views on people who commit crime. So, but the point is that Donald Trump is courting the community in much stronger and more respectful, even though he's not usually a respectful guy, and then, than the Harris campaign is. He stood there, he uh, called them up to the stage, he said positive things about them, he let them speak. I can tell you, a lot of people in this community were swayed, not myself, of course, a lot of people were swayed by that, 
and we swayed by the attention he's given. Yeah, he was um, on the stage at one point or, or, or commentated on by uh, an imam there in Michigan uh, by the name of Bilal and by the mayor of Dearborn Heights. Yeah. And he, he introduced the mayor and stood there next to him and let him speak, gave him time to speak. And uh, so it's, it's to me, that's um, he's showing a lot of attention to this community. And for many people, especially not the very sophisticated usually, because you have to look beyond, you know, you have to see a little bit what everybody stands for and not what they say today. And a lot of people were swayed by that. And I'm hearing a lot more people in the last few days saying, we're voting for Trump. Yeah, but I want to ask you a bit more about the this. The numbers, of course, will tell us. Within a week, we'll know. Sure. And, and, and just that imam who was there in, in Michigan on, on Saturday or Sunday calling Donald Trump the peace candidate. But, you know, people have got long memories. They're going to remember his... Uh, term in office that kicked off with that um, Muslim ban. Uh, we heard him talking at the weekend about deporting uh, foreigners in large numbers. Um, and people are also going to remember that uh, Donald Trump as president was close to uh, Benjamin Netanyahu. Um, people haven't forgotten that, have they? No, they haven't. Let me tell you, we're not naive. Personally, I can tell you, I know Netanyahu wants Donald Trump today as opposed to Biden, but here's the problem. And people are concerned about the immigration consequences of Donald Trump being elected. Although there are laws he cannot sidestep, even though he's good at sidestepping laws, but there are things that can protect people. But that being said, even if it's true everything that people fear from Donald Trump, today we have two choices. We have, I mean, the country has two choices. One administration that's killing, participating in killing, which to me, as a lawyer, I can tell you, participating in killing or helping somebody kill is the same under US law. So you have an administration that's participating in the killing of tens and hundreds, maybe of thousands of Arab, uh, Arabs in Gaza and in Lebanon now. And you have a guy who all we fear about is some deportation. Let me tell you, between preserving my life and deporting me, guess what I'm going to pick? Sure, fair enough. Um, some people think of Muslim voters in particular as being more conservative uh, by by definition, and, and I wonder whether you agree with that. And, and do you think with, uh, with regards to what a lot of what Donald Trump is saying, whether that chimes with the more conservative elements of the Muslim American voting demographic, or do you think it's a, a question of age, age group? You have an excellent and loaded question. I'm going to give you the shortest answer I can. Uh, the Republican Party has always, before Trump even, realized there, is, uh, there are a lot of commonalities between the Muslim religion and the conservative values, or at least the values that the Republican Party, remember I'm a Democrat, claim to have. So the, uh, this idea of conservatives going to the Republican Party from the Muslim community has been gaining ground in recent years, but slowly, not at the speed it did, of course, now as ca accelerated by the Gaza and the Lebanon events. But there's no question, there are a big segment in the community today they will vocalize their support for Republicans in general and for Trump in particular, based on conservative values and what they believe are the commonalities between what Islam says and what uh, Donald Trump says. The only thing is these people sometimes will not study hard enough to see what Donald Trump personally believes in. But the reality is absolutely the conservative value commonality is something that the Republican Party has been working on and gaining ground in this community, but the war made him gain much faster ground in much shorter time. And, and just to be clear, we are talking about a demographic here that is overwhelmingly pro-Palestinian, aren't we? There are, there, there are almost Absolutely. no exceptions it, to that. It's, it's not just pro-Palestinians. Is You have to understand, whatever country we come from, especially those who come from the countries surrounding Israel, uh, we know it's not just pro, we are pro-Palestinians, of course, but we are pro-humanity. We have seen what the Israelis can do and how much killing they can perform using Americans' weapons that I and others in this country pay for with our tax dollars. I lived under the occupation in Lebanon. I left Lebanon at age um, 19 years old, and I was there in the first uh, 70, 1978 invasion and a second 1982 invasion of Lebanon. My village is close to the border, and I lived under occupation. Occupation breeds what they're afraid of, breeds resistance. That's what happened in Lebanon. The Israelis come to Lebanon and people welcome them in 1982, and they start doing what occupiers do, the, the dirtiest, nastiest way of occupation, like they did in Gaza and the West Bank and everywhere, and like they're doing now. I mean, for God's sake, they're killing journalists while their own journalists are going there and pushing the button 
for exploding houses in South Lebanon on the border and bragging about it. I'm sure you guys seen this. It's insane. So it's not just pro-Palestinian. We have we have humans. As an American, I'm outraged. I know the American values. It's my American values that are offended and outraged by what the Israelis are doing right now. Um, do you think it's too late for there to be any kind of a diplomatic breakthrough between now and Election Day? I mean, it's only eight days, but we are hearing reports that some progress is being made in uh, possibly in Doha, and there's a proposal put on the table by the Egyptians. Uh, could something happen between now and Election Day that might swing some voters? Uh, you want my personal opinion based on my experience, my knowledge, and watching how the conduct of the war and the so-called negotiations happened since October 2023, a year ago. Um, I think this is just smoke screens and fluff. Uh, the Biden administration trying to uh, pre uh, make people believe that there may be some optimism, but we know that stuff doesn't translate into actual ceasefire uh, based on experience. But more importantly, I personally believe that Netanyahu will not do anything to stop the war until the election is over because he wants a Biden, he wants Trump to win. So I was speculating with some of my friends between the uh, the resistance they're getting into invading Lebanon, they're getting, you know, really is being very costly for them since they put foot on the ground in Lebanon. And between the election, I'm hoping that within 10 days, we start having serious talk about ceasefire. But I don't believe Netanyahu will hand the Biden administration any type of ceasefire before the election. He doesn't want Harris to win. And honestly, I'm not sure Biden wants Harris to win or Blinken wants Harris to win. I'm not sure. And I know it's, it may sound crazy to some here, but at the end of the day, President Biden was, was pushed out of the race to have Harris take over. And Blinken knows he probably would not be the Secretary of State after. And he said he's he going to Israel as a Jewish person, not as a Secretary of State in the U.S. So I think here, call me conspiracy theorist, but I think that Netanyahu, Biden, Blinken, nobody wants a ceasefire before the election is over. Um, and all the while, this support for Israel from Biden and, by extension, Kamala Harris, his vice president, who's now running for president herself, hasn't really translated, as far as I'm aware, maybe you, you, you can help me on this one, into more support from Jewish Americans, has it? I don't think so. Actually, in fact, I said a few, few weeks ago, what I don't understand about the Harris campaign, if they called and they actually genuinely, genuinely called and genuinely actually obtained a ceasefire, I don't see them losing Jewish vote over getting a ceasefire because take off the few extremists in Israel, the one that's in government, especially the Smochers and the uh, Ben Gafirs and the Netanyahu's, people want peace everywhere. So I have a lot of Jewish friends here, they don't want war. So I think calling for peace and obtaining a ceasefire would not have hurt Harris with the Jewish community would have helped her with the Muslim and Arab community. It was a win-win politically. I didn't see a loss in it. Nobody's asking her to go create a Palestinian state tomorrow. We just say, stop the killing. And she could have done it without losing one single Jewish vote. I mean, I don't know, one single is exaggerating, but I don't think she lose Jewish vote if she reaches ceasefire and a deal in the Middle East. In fact, everybody would be happy because the overwhelming of Jews, the same thing as overwhelming people of Arabs, they want peace. They just want to stop the killing. And of course, Muslim uh, Americans are the fastest growing religious group of any religious group in the United States. I mean, a real mistake to ignore this important and growing demographic. I mean, clearly, in future elections, we're not going to see politicians making that same mistake, are we? Uh, no, and as you mentioned earlier, you know, the conservative values, one of the part of the conservative values, we have a lot of kids and we believe in family and expanding our families. So yeah, we are growing demographics, as you said. And definitely, uh, in, in, in one of the reasons, one of the consequences, I believe personally, uh, if Harris loses Michigan, particularly, and loses the presidency, which will probably be a very bad thing for this country, because I personally don't believe Trump is a good, will be a good president. But I can tell you, if Harris loses, one of the goals that we want as a community is to teach others that don't take us for granted anymore and deal with us like we are real Americans, real humans. Uh, to use a cliche, but Muslim and Arab lives should matter. They matter. They should matter for the Democratic administration, should matter for Republican administrations in the future. So definitely that would be one of the consequences, regardless what happened in this election, that they're going to pay more attention, I hope, in the future. Because we're not going anywhere. We are Americans as Americans as anybody else. And being American and a Muslim, they're not contradictory. Let's just uh, go back to uh, Michigan. 
uh, of course, lots of focus on Michigan. Uh, 100,000 Jewish people live in the state, 400,000 people of Arab origin, not all of them Muslim, but pr probably a majority. Um, so that's why there's a lot of focus. How tight is the race now looking like being there in Michigan? Uh, I watched the polls on um, the main media outlets, Washington Post, New York Times. I think they've always been within one point percentage, depends how uh, how it uh, it moves. But it's been, in the recent days, has been what they call a plus one uh, or a plus less than one percent for Harris, which means that's within the margin of error. And if you look at the uh, how the polls were wrong in the last couple of years, and you project that I'm an engineer before I was a lawyer, so I look at these numbers. And um, if you project that today, if the mistakes in the polling, which we all know there will be mistakes, are uh, proved to be right the same way the trend was in 2012, 2016, and 2020, most likely Trump will win the state. But I don't know. I mean, honestly, uh, this day and age, you have no idea what's going to happen. OK, so those 400,000 uh, people in Michigan of Arab and Muslim origin could, could swing the results. Absolutely. Okay, we're absolutely. Have to leave it there. Like I said, in twenty in twenty sixteen, it was a ten thousand vote difference. I can tell you, almost the Hamouds in my town will get ten thousand votes, and uh, in twenty twenty, it was one hundred fifty thousand votes. So that's pretty tight. All right, we're gonna have to leave it there. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us, Abed Hamoud. Thank you very Thank much you. indeed. Well, against this backdrop, a pertinent question arises. How will these unfolding events in the Middle East influence the um, upcoming U.S. elections? Well, I'm joined now by the former Israeli ambassador to the United States, Itamar Rabinovich, who's also a professor at New York University. Professor Rabinovich, thank you very much indeed for talking to us. Um, lots happened during the course of the weekend, uh, and it's difficult to know where to begin. There was the uh, Israeli strike on Iran. Uh, negotiations have begun again in Doha. Uh, and there's been these vigorous final stages of campaigning uh, for the U.S. election. Now, I'd like to start by talking about the U.S. election, because you said recently at the Silfen Forum at the University of Pennsylvania, it's unlikely anything will change before the U.S. presidential election with regards to the situation uh, in the Middle East. Right. But what do you think the election will actually change? Well, you, you can look at the significance of the U.S. elections at two levels, the the more important, the deeper level is, of course, the question, who is going to be the president? What kind of Middle Eastern policy or foreign policy in general would uh, either Kamala Harris or Donald Trump uh, carry out with huge implications for the whole world and for the region? And there is the more immediate question uh, of uh, the actors uh, on the scene, the Israelis, uh, the Lebanese, the Iranians, and the others, who ask themselves, do I really want to make any move or any concession uh, before uh, November 5, before I know who the president is going to be? And the answer to that easier question is no. I mean, no one would want to, quote unquote, waste a concession uh, before they know who the president is going to be. You recently echoed the established wisdom that Americans vote with their pocketbooks, and uh, opinion polls do suggest that foreign policy isn't a top priority for many American voters. But do you think that's changed at all in the 30 or more years that you've been closely following uh, US affairs? Um, yes, the average American voter is not particularly interested in, in foreign policy. People tend to vote more by the pocketbook or by, I'd say, the image, um, uh, quote-unquote tribal, uh, ethnic, or other preferences, not foreign policy. But yet, many Americans would like to know that their president is a person uh, who can manage the foreign policy uh, of the United States and to play the role on the international stage arena that uh, the president uh, of the United States should. I mean, there were American presidents like um, Bush 41 uh, <clears throat> or Jimmy Carter, who had major exploits in foreign policy in the Middle East, and yet lost the election for, uh, for other reasons. Um, let's talk about the uh, Israeli strike on Iran during the course of the weekend. Um, how do you think uh, Iran might respond? 
Um, uh, of course, I, uh, uh, and most people don't know, um, I, would, I would say this. First of all, the Iranians are trying to minimize the, the scope and the effect of the attack. And I mean, uh, they have more than one reason for doing that, but one additional reason might be their decision not to respond and therefore to try to minimize the effect and therefore they need to respond to it. Second, during the attack, apparently, Israel successfully, or the Israeli Air Force, successfully destroyed the uh, Iranian uh, ground-to-air missile systems. And now, in a way, um, most Iranian installations uh, are not protected. This is, of course, a blow to Iran, but also a blow to Russia, because uh, uh, these systems the SA-3 and to some extent the SA-4 were provided by Russia. They are the pride of uh, the Russian uh, Air Force. Um, this is something the Russians like to export and to, to sell for significant sums of money. And therefore, it's a blow not just to Iran, but also to its ally, Russia. I know, Professor, you can't second guess what, what Iran's going to do, and I appreciate that. But do you... Do you buy into the argument that the Iranians have to respond to what Israel did? Because if they don't, they're going to look weak. They don't have to because um, if they, they do know that if they respond, then Israel would respond and we enter an endless um, or a vicious cycle of uh, blow and response. And given what I said a bit earlier, that right now they don't have effective uh, system against uh, uh, Israeli, the Israeli Air Force, it's not very tempting for them to, to engage in yet another round. So this is, I would say, on the realm of the rational. But uh, we know that in many of these cases, particularly in a system where uh, ideological forces are at work and there is a competition between radicals and moderates, and there is one man, the supreme leader, who ends up making the decision, not a very young man, uh, making any prediction on whether there will or there will not be an Iranian response is, of course, a, a shot in the dark. Let's talk about the diplomatic efforts to bring about a conclusion or pause to the fighting in Gaza. Egypt has just proposed a short ceasefire um, deal which would entail the exchange of prisoners and hostages. Um, what's your understanding with regards to that? Do you think we could be on the brink of the first significant breakthrough since um, November of last year? We might. It depends, it depends on the question of whether Hamas, after the, the killing of uh, Sinwar, uh, has been able to put together an alternative effective leadership that can make decisions and and enforce them. Of course, we know that many of the hostages are spread around, not necessarily held by Hamas, some by Islamic Jihad, some by local, local families. It's not so easy uh, to collect them and, and deliver them when, when the moment comes. And of course, it comes down to the question of the price. If, if the Hamas decision is that in order to have any deal, Israel must in a way, end the war and withdraw fully from Gaza, this is not something the Netanyahu government will accept because it would mean that more than a year after the beginning of the war, the war ended without a victory, namely in a defeat. So not very likely. But of course, Hamas has been severely degraded in, in recent months. Um, do you think they're more receptive or they're likely to be more receptive now to new initiatives like this one than they uh, would have been before? Yeah, they, they should. Of course, they should be much more receptive. But again, come to the question, is it an organization that makes rational decision or decisions on standards that we are familiar with? Uh, an organization that decided to stage a terrorist attack and to perpetrate uh, such horrific atrocities you know, the quote unquote, to send a message is an organization whose uh, decisions are not easily predictable. And from the Israeli perspective, we've mentioned Yahya Sinwar already. I mean, he's been dead for two weeks now. What, what else does 
Israel uh, need to achieve in order to claim uh, victory and put a stop to uh, the suffering of the 2.2 million people who are living in horrific con conditions in Gaza? Yeah, not just the people in Gaza. It's, uh, it's also bad for many, many Israelis, those who are being evicted from their homes and, and many others. We need, to, we need to end the war, of course, in consideration of the suffering of Palestinians, but also of, of the high toll on Israel, both in Gaza and both in, both in Lebanon. It's, everybody wants to, to bring an end to this war and to start a normal to life to the extent that normal is, uh, uh, is feasible. So uh, Israel would need to know that there is a government uh, or an authority in Gaza that it can live with, that people would go back to, to their homes knowing or feeling certain that uh, October 7 will not repeat itself. And people in further away in Israel would know that missiles would not be fired uh, from the Gaza Strip at will, as has been the case for so many times since Hamas took over in 2007. So we would need to know that. The uh, latest uh, initiative, we understand, is supported by most Israeli government ministers uh, and national security chiefs there in, in Israel. But we understand the finance minister, uh, Bezalel Smotrich, and the national security minister, Itamar Ben-Gavir, do not support uh, the, this, this proposal. They represent pretty major obstacles, don't they, to peace? They are because... Um, they could bring uh, the coalition and, uh, and the government down, and it's very important for Mr. Netanyahu to remain in power. If I were in his shoes, I would have made a decision. Of course, it would help if the United States could arrange the normalization between Israel and Saudi Arabia. This, this would be a jewel in uh, any prime minister's crown and would enable Mr. Netanyahu to take the risk of losing this government, running for election and doing well, because he would have been the prime minister who achieved normalization with Saudi Arabia. This, of course, depends on a Saudi decision, on the ability of the US government to, to produce that. Not very easy for a, an administration about to end its term. So it's, a, it's not a very high probability prospect, but it could make a big difference. Do you think the uh, right people are at the table uh, with regards to these latest negotiations? And I'm talking about the US, Qatar and Egypt who are really spearheading uh, the negotiations. Are they the right parties to be at the table or is, uh, should, should there be other parties at the table? Yeah, there's, uh, you know, the e Egypt and Qatar over the past year have not been very effective in being able to bring Hamas to to agree to, uh, to a deal. Uh, I know that Egypt has a clear interest and Egypt has no particular love for Hamas, which is the Palestinian version of the Muslim Brotherhood. And Qatar is a country knows for, for playing, I would say, very complex games. It has, it has its interest vested in many, many places. So it may not have been the best intermediaries. Uh, Okay. When we have uh, an American administration in place, be it the continuation of the Biden-Harris administration or a new Trump administration, um, which may not be before, before the winter or early spring, I think we will have a, a, perhaps a very effective actor, but this, this may take time. Yeah, and in terms of the parties and the, and the, and the various players who, who play a part in uh, this continuing conflict, I mean, looking at the heavy presence of uh, far-right religious and ultra-nationalist politicians uh, in Israel, I mean, they don't sound like people who are at all interested in peace or a two-state solution, do they? Yeah. You, you don't have to, to lean on me very hard to, to get me to say that. I'm, I'm, I'm not an admirer of either Smotrich or Ben Gvir. I think they don't belong in a government in, in Israel. I would like to see an election in Israel soon and a new government in place without these two very extremist uh, politicians in power. 
If you could point the finger of blame at one person for the situation we're in now, and this is a, this is a tough question, <laughs> who would you point the finger of blame at for the situation we are in today with regards to the uh, ongoing violence and the state of war between Israel and, there, and the Palestinians? You know, there isn't really one person, but I would put in one country, that's Iran. This is the country that built the so-called axis of resistance, that built the system of proxies around Israel, which includes both Hamas and uh, Hezbollah. Uh, Hamas perpetrated October 7. Hezbollah joined the war in a limited way, but joined the war on October 8. Uh, Iran, for a long time, tried to hide behind its proxies and, and use them, but Ultimately, it had no choice but to step to the front and participate itself. So it is the one party I would point to as responsible for the current situation. I'd like to talk a bit about your time as Israeli ambassador to the United States, because it was a really interesting time for you to have been there, 1993 uh, to 1996. So we're talking uh, 30 years ago. Um, there must have been a huge sense of optimism given you know, the talks that were taking place at the time and uh, the progress that seemed to be being made. And, and looking back on that and looking at where we are today must, must be quite depressing. Uh, it is because my, my, my period in Washington when I was both an ambassador and a peace negotiator with Syria was a period of high hope. Uh, there was the Oslo Accord, there was peace with Jordan. And we were... Uh, as I call it in one of my books, on the brink of peace with uh, Syria. There was a degree of normalization with many Arab countries. The Middle East peace conferences took place. And there was a lot of hope in the air. And then around 1995, it began to, uh, to turn, become ugly. And uh, that, that was the end of that period. There were subsequent efforts to negotiate both with Syria and with the Palestinian Authority, uh, but none of that came through. You were very close, weren't you, to Prime Minister uh, Yitzhak Rabin. Uh, you wrote a, a biography about him. Um, we're coming up to the 30th anniversary of his assassination, and I just wonder what you'd th you think he would make of the situation uh, we're in today. What would he have to say about the state of affairs uh, in Israel and the Palestinian, in the Palestinian territories today? Of course, he will be disappointed and, uh, and critical. Uh, Rabin wanted to, Rabin at the time, wanted to end uh, the, the conflicts between Israel and its immediate neighbors, the Palestinians, the Syrians, the Lebanese, the Jordanians, in order to deal with what he saw as the big dangers from the East, Iraq at the time, that was Saddam Hussein's Iraq and Iran. And he, he was a strategic thinker. He had a vision, and the reason that his death had been so detrimental to the peace process was that he was an, the, the one Israeli leader who, A, wanted to, to make peace, and B, could carry the public with him. And when the assassin and the group that stood behind the assassin uh, killed him, they knew very well what they were doing. They, they killed the one person who, who could do it. And I should add in brackets, that some of the characters who are today, some of the rabbis today who are behind Smotrich and Bengvir, were the same rabbis who uh, sanctioned the killing of uh, Rabin. So in that regard, not much has changed. Yeah, Yitzhak Rabin is, is, is dead. Yasser Arafat is dead. The then Israeli foreign minister, Shimon Peres, is also dead. And, and uh, you know, the peace process as we knew it in, in, in those optimistic days of the mid-90s when you were in Washington, also appears to be dead. What needs to be done to bring it back to life? And who would be the three players that would need to fill the shoes of those three uh, deceased gentlemen? Well, in the thing is, um, when you want to move forward, is not to, to look back with uh, nostalgia, but to ask what is realistic now, whether we want to get and, and who can get it done. So um, 
You know, Netanyahu has been in power for a very long time. There was a hiatus of a year and a half when we had the Bennett Lapid government, which was a good government. There are substitutes for Netanyahu in Israel. I won't name names, uh, but there are several. Um, and, you know, when it comes to Iran, the decision making, or when it comes to Hamas, uh, Hezbollah, the partners that we need to deal with, um, you know, I. I cannot tell who, who, who could or would be the, the leader there, but it's not just them, it's the whole, the whole region. I mean, the Abraham Accord was signed, it was a very important move, and they are functioning. And of course, uh, uh, the, the missing actor, which we all are looking forward to, is uh, Saudi Arabia. We hope that a way can be found when there is a new administration in the United States to bring about Saudi-Israeli normalization that would be a key element in building a, a coalition in the Middle East that would contain Iran and prevent it from doing what it has been doing for so long. Professor, this is my last question to you. I just want to ask you, I mean, looking back at these tragic events of the last uh, 55 weeks it's been now, since the 7th of October, um, do you think somehow, and this is obviously requiring a good deal of optimism in your, in, your, in your mindset, do you think this could somehow trigger a newfound appetite for peace and for a two-state solution? It, it, it could in theory. I'm, I'm less, less optimistic in practice. Uh, you know, we had in 1973, 1974, a very rapid transition with Egypt from war to peace. But uh, there was no, there was a sense in the air that Egypt and Israel were not enemies. There was the issue of the Sinai, and once it was settled, we could move on into peacemaking and, and keeping it. Uh, the Israeli Palestinian conflict is much more complex. It's a national conflict between two national movements. Each of them claims that absolute uh, right is on its side. Iran says it is a theocracy dominated by uh, ayatollahs. Uh, I'm not that optimistic uh, in that regard. OK, well, we're going to let you go. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. Professor Thank you Ishmael for speaking with me. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Well, that is all we have time for on Global News today. Thank you very much indeed for watching. Be sure to join us again tomorrow for more exclusive interviews. Until then, goodbye.